بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليم كثيرا أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار as it was announced, today's topic is concerning what has been described as the forgotten etiquette, and that is having the correct edib and knowing how to deal with other people who have a different opinion. When there's ikhtilaf between the Muslims, there is a way to behave dependent upon the ikhtilaf and dependent upon other issues and variables. If people were to get the fit of this issue, I think we will have a lot less animosity and a lot less problems, hatred, and rancor between ourselves. As you're going to see, inshallah, as we gel, the companions of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they had ikhtilaf between themselves. They had a lot of ikhtilaf, actually, a lot. And we'll explain, inshallah, what type of ikhtilaf that they had. And that's because the issue of having ikhtilaf and differences of opinion is something that is natural. As Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, خلقهم, Had it been the intention of Allah, had Allah wanted he would have made everyone on the same religion, one ummah, the same ummah. But the people will not cease to have differences of opinions between themselves except the people that Allah has rahma upon. So when people are not having ikhtilaf between themselves, especially the ikhtilaf that leads to anger, hatred, animosity, rancor, that's a sign of the rahma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sign of rahma of Allah. And when there's ikhtilaf between the people and they're fighting and carrying on in that type of way, that's a sign of the punishment of Allah. That ikhtilaf is an adab. And that's what we have dealing with the ummah today. So the ayah said, and for this reason, Allah created them. He created them to have ikhtilaf. No people, even if they share the same mother and the father, are going to think the same in every issue, even if they happen to be identical twins. It's not something that's going to happen. Allah commanded the Prophet in another ayah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fa'fu anhum wastaghfir lahum wa shawirhum fil amr. So Muhammad, as it relates to your companions who are with you, overlook them and pardon their mistakes and ask Allah to forgive them and take the shura or the consultation with them. Take the shura. And there is a surah that was revealed in the Quran, Surah to shura This ayat and this command is a sign and indication that there's going to be ikhtilaf. Because how many times did the Prophet wasallam take the advice and the opinions of multiple companions about the same issue and there was ikhtilaf. Last Friday at this time was Saturday. We gave the talk about Umar radiallahu anhu. We talked about his virtues and from his virtues is... Whenever the people had ikhtilaf about an issue, the haq usually went back to Umar, ridwanullahi alayhi. So the Prophet would ask him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what's your opinion about this, ya Umar? He would give his opinion. And what's your opinion, Abu Bakr? Abu Bakr would give an opposite or different opinion of Umar. So that's ikhtilaf. And one time, this issue led to some problems, some heated discussion between Abu Bakr and Umar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa took the shura and asked Abu Bakr, who do you think we should make as the emir over this particular tribe? Abu Bakr said, Fulan. He said, what about you, Umar? Who do you think? Umar said, Fulan. Someone else, ikhtilaf. And they started to argue in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Abu Bakr said, you only chose that man to be different from me because I chose this man. He said, no, I didn't. And they started going back and forth. 
And Allah revealed the ayat of the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawta al-nabi wa la tajharu lahu bil-qawl ka jahri ba'dikum ba'da. All you who believe, don't raise your voices over the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And don't scream out and shout out to him the way you scream out and you shout out to each other. This is not acceptable. So the point here is the shura is a delil and the proof that there's going to be ikhtilaf between the people. It's, it's going to happen. Islam doesn't say that this is something that's not permissible. The ikhtilaf is something that is natural. But it is an ikhtilaf that is haram that al-Islam came to say, don't fall into this. Don't fall into that ikhtilaf where you stop being brothers, you stop being relatives or giving the relatives the haq, you stop being fair and just towards other people. The ikhtilaf of al-hawa, al-asabiyya, the ikhtilaf where there's no dalil, a person is following his desires. As a result of that, he has ikhtilaf. An individual is muta'asib, He's fanatical about his group or his opinion, his madhab, his imam. As a result of that, he has ikhtilaf. This is the ikhtilaf that is haram in al-Islam. And it is a kabira from the kabair because it is what the mushrikeen are upon as many of the ayahs of the Quran warned against and described. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ تَفَرِّقُوا وَاخْتَرُفُوا مِن بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ do not be like those people who divided amongst themselves and they had ikhtilaf between themselves. That's unnecessary. Verily, they are the people going to get a grievous punishment. And aqimuddin, wala tatafarruqu fi. Allah told all of the prophets, Nuh, Muhammad, Musa, Isa, Ibrahim, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, and gave them the wasiyah that they should not have ikhtilaf in their religion and the people should follow the one Dalil to the best of their ability. So this type of ikhtilaf is not permissible. During the time of the Prophet Sallallahu the companions had ikhtilaf, no problem. But as time went on, the ikhtilaf became more, it became increased, and it became problematic, like what we have today. And those are the meanings of those hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu said, in nohu man yaish minkum fa sayyara ikhtilaf in kathira. Verily, those from amongst you, he said to his companions, anyone from amongst you that lives a long time after me, you're going to see a lot of ikhtilaf. And that ikhtilaf transpired with some of the companions, but not to the level that it is today. Not to the level that it is today. So he told the people, take my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa al-rashidin al mahdiin and hold on to it with your mullahs. He told us that this ummah was going to divide up and split up and have ikhtilaf till we become 73 groups. So this happens later on. But during the time of the companions, Ridwallahi alayhim, as you're going to see, it wasn't to that degree. It was a lot of ikhtilaf. And I remember a few years back in this masjid, we did a class in this masjid. I would advise you to go back and find that class. I don't know what they called it, but it was the real examples of how the companions had ikhtilaf in issues, and when the haq and the dalil went to the person who was on the other position, once they heard the dalil, they submitted. Because there's no one who's ma'asum except the Prophet ﷺ. He's the only one who's infallible. So when the companions used to have ikhtilaf, the one who was doing something and the one who was doing something else, when the dalil, the proof was presented, they will submit, unlike today. If you try to tell someone this thing that you're doing in the religion, this thing that you're believing in the religion, this thing the way that you're practicing, it is wrong. They're not going to change their opinion no matter what. And that's a characteristic of the Yahud, the Nasara, and the Mushrikun of Quraysh. And that is, if you bring them all of the ayat, they're never going to follow those ayat. They're never going to follow the delil because they want to do something else. The second issue, Khwani, is because of the danger of the issue and the importance of the issue, the scholars of Islam, as we mentioned many times, they never left any stone unturned. Every book has been written for us about every issue. 
Every stone has been turned over. No one's going to come and find something new in this religion. Because if it's important and people need to know the knowledge of it, then the ulama of Al-Islam, past and present, they came and they took care of the wajibat. So they wrote specific books about ikhtilaf. Not only that, not only that, but they showed how getting knowledge of the ikhtilaf between the ulama is one of the prerequisites of being a scholar. The more the person is aware and he knows about the ikhtilaf between the scholars, whether it's the ikhtilaf between the madhahib or the ikhtilaf between the scholars of one madhab, but knowing the varying positions is something that the scholars used to see as being a prerequisite if you wanted to be a serious student of knowledge. Obviously, this is not something you start off learning because it's more difficult, it's more complicated, and there are things that have priority over this. But at some point, the serious student of knowledge has to get some kind of exposure to the ikhtilaf. So those scholars, they wrote books, like the great scholar of Islam, Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Nasr al-Marwazi, has a book called Ikhtilaf al-Fuqaha. He brings all of those mas'alas. The book is a book of hadith and fiqh. Wudu, Salat, Adhan, Juma, all of that stuff. And he just says, what were the different opinions of the scholar? So the person comes, he reads that, and he'll get the exposure that's needed. So that when he hears an opinion in Al-Islam, he knows how to deal with it. Sometimes some of us, we look at some of these opinions and we see people doing certain things and we know that they're wrong. It's ikhtilaf in the issue. But when we see them doing it, we say some terrible things. And we look at them in a terrible way. When in reality, there were people who were greater than that individual who took that position. So if you knew that an imam or imams from the religion took that position, if you're going to hate this man for saying that thing and be rough and tough with him and he barely has any knowledge, then if you're going to be fair and just and consistent in your ruling and your opinion, you have to feel the same way about that imam. In some of our local masjids, the Hanafi Madhab, when people come in, the Imam is praying, Salatul Fajr, he's praying, and the Jama'ah is there. And then we see some of those people on the side in the back praying the two rakat. And we come in and we don't like that because that's not the correct way to do. But some of the major scholars said this is something that's permissible. It's wrong, inshallah, because the Dalil is not with them and they took that position for a reason, as you're going to see, inshallah. But if I look at people like that and I say, well, what are, they, what are you doing? No, I can't look at him for that issue. So since I know that there's ikhtilaf in that issue, I'm going to look at it in a just way. Deal with him in a just way. And therein lies, ikhwani, a lot of the ilaj and a lot of the solving of the problems that we have today. If we understood the fiqh of ikhtilaf, we would realize, I can't love or hate a person because Sheikh so-and-so said about that person. Especially in light of the fact that Sheikh said one thing about him and that Sheikh said another thing about him. And I can't go and say, anyone who doesn't take this Sheikh's position, then you're this and you're that and I'm against you. No, we have to understand the etiquette of an ikhtilaf. So those ulama wrote those books. And Imam al-Bayhaqi has a book called Al-Khilafiyat. Many, many, many books. For this reason, now again, I want to repeat because I don't want this point to go over your head. The scholars of the past considered the person a serious student of knowledge, a serious scholar. You have to have certain knowledges. They came to Ali ibn Abi Talib. They said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, there is a man who's teaching in the, Quran, in the masjid, he's teaching. Ali said, does he know the nasikh and the mansukh? He's telling stories. Does he know the knowledge of a nasikh wal mansukh? They said, no, we don't think he knows that. He said, well, he's astray and he's sending people astray. Because the knowledge of a nasikh wal mansukh is from the prerequisites for a person to be talking about the religion. So that he doesn't give a fatwa about something that has been abrogated. This issue is like that. Especially in the past. You have to know the khilaf of the people. The more ikhtilaf you know about and why, the more fairer and the juster you will be, the more just you will be as it relates to how you deal with people. 
how you pass rulings upon people. Al-Wala wa bara and these issues like that. So when those scholars wrote those books about how to be a student of knowledge, Al-Imam Al-Khatib Al-Baghdadi, they used to write books. How do you teach and how do you learn? The do's and don'ts. He has a book called Al-Jami' li akhlaq al-Rawi wa adab al-Sami' He brings this chapter in there, the ikhtilaf in how to be. Al-Imam al-Shafi'i used to differ with people. He would differ with his friend, somebody. He would say, hey, Yunus, Yunus Safadi, although we differ with each other, I don't see what you're saying, you don't see what I'm saying, but shall we not still remain brothers although we are differing? It's not like that today. I believe you have to do raf'ul yadain. And if you don't believe you have to do raf'ul yadain, I'm going to boycott you. That's how it is today. I believe that you must say I mean after the imam. And you don't believe that. So if I'm in the masjid where they don't say amin and I say amin, people want to jump on you after that. They're saying you're disturbing the prayer. The imam will come to you and say, the elder said, can you please stop coming to this masjid because you're disturbing us and you can't disturb people in the masjid. And he uses a delil that you can't disturb people. No, it's not like that. It's not like that. When we know these issues, we're able to deal with people in a better way. So now, I'm going to give you guys, inshallah, you brothers, you sisters, some examples of why there was ikhtilaf. And who are we talking about? Ikhtilaf with the companions. And they had a lot of ikhtilaf. But what was their ikhtilaf? And what was it about? Their ikhtilaf, alhamdulillah, was not in the asul of the religion. There was no ikhtilaf between the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam concerning the usul of al-Islam. None of them had any ikhtilaf. They had ikhtilaf in the branches of the religion, the furu' of the religion. During the time of the Prophet, they had ikhtilaf, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But it was much less. It was much less because he was there. He was with them. And those ayahs of the Quran, they command them. وَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّهُ وَلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ if you companions Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Ukash, Bilal, Zayd, if you people have any ikhtilaf between yourselves about anything, then go back and refer it to Allah and his messenger. So anytime something would happen, they would go to him and say, Ya Rasulullah, we have ikhtilaf. What about this? What about that? He would say it. The Quran would come down. So there wasn't a lot of ikhtilaf between them when he was here. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Wa radduhu ila rasul and only if they would have referred the issue back to the messenger وسلم, and to those other companions who were endowed with knowledge Abu Bakr, Umar and those ulama then the ignorant ones, the ones who didn't know they would have come to know what is the ruling now after the death of the prophet وسلم, when he was no longer there to be the judge he was no longer there physically to give them irshad and tojihat, to give them guidance and instruction. He wasn't there anymore. Now naturally, naturally, there's going to be more ikhtilaf. As soon as he died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's ikhtilaf. Did he die or didn't he not die? Umar said he didn't die. Other people say yes, he's dead. Other people said that. And then there were those who didn't know. It's ikhtilaf. And Umar said to the people, anybody who says that he died, I'm going to kill you because you are munafiq. And he was with them severe in this issue. But what we're going to do is we're going to look for an excuse for Umar radiallahu anhu because he's a companion and he's a scholar. And that condition that he was in is like a severe condition that anyone can be in. Someone does something to someone's mother or someone close to him. Generally speaking, he's a fan, he's a just guy. But when someone disrespects his mother, he may go overboard in his response because he's so angry. So we're going to make an excuse. Umar, don't someone come and say, but Umar was rough with the people, took the sword out, said, we're going to kill you if you disagree with what I'm saying. He wasn't saying if you disagree with my point of view. He thought, he thought at that moment, at that moment, he forgot. He thought that, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wouldn't die at that particular time, so he said what he said. But anyway, the point is, they had ikhtilaf. Who's going to be the khalifa? 
The companions had ikhtilaf between themselves. But how did they deal with each other? And that ikhtilaf, both of them, could have led to bloodshed. It could have led to bloodshed. Umar was threatening people. What if someone would have gotten up and stood up and said, no, Umar, and started challenging him. Maybe it led to bloodshed. But no one stood up. Everybody stayed in their place until the bigger scholar came, Abu Bakr, and he rectified the issue. Radhi Allah anhu. When the Prophet died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there could have been civil war between the Ansar and the Muhajireen. Could have been. But no, they didn't do that. They started bringing the proof, the proofs that would solve the problem. When Abu Bakr came again, and this is one of the reasons, Ikhwani, that Abu Bakr is better than all of those other nine people who were promised Jannah. And may Allah put all of us in Jannah to Firdos with them. Because his positions at critical times was unparalleled. He came and he said, no, 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 no. You Ansar, you can't choose an emir from you and an emir from us. We're going to choose an emir from us and you have an emir from you. We, we can't do that. I heard the Prophet say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the khilafah has to be with Quraysh because the Quraysh are the Umara. We have to be the emirs. And he said that you people, the Ansar, you are the wuzara. You are our helpers. You are the wazir. When they heard that hadith, and at that time is Hadith Ahad. Only Abu Bakr mentioned it. Only Abu Bakr knew it. No one said, oh, you got to bring someone else. They accepted it. When they heard that Hadith, they know that Abu Bakr doesn't lie. When they heard that, they submitted. The Delil came, that's it. And it was a critical time. A tough time. A hot time. Abu Bakr, Umar's time was tough. When he heard the ayat of the Quran, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا الرَّسُولُ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِ الرَّسُولُ when he heard that ayat, he just accepted it. It was heavy, but he just accepted it. Not like the people today. We push the delil back, and we find every reason and every excuse to stick to the ikhtilaf, although we don't even know. It doesn't even make sense. Or you know it's weak. So what are some of the reasons that the companions of Ridwam Allah had ikhtilaf? And the ikhtilaf was lesser than everybody else. It wasn't a lot during the Prophet's time, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But after he died, they had more, more, much more ikhtilaf. But the ikhtilaf was not in the usul of the religion. It was in the furur. That ikhtilaf and issues concerning administration. That ikhtilaf and issues concerning the fiqh, halal and haram. That ikhtilaf in marriage and divorce. Ikhtilaf in many things, many things. But they're all from the branches. To make it easy for you, inshallah, the examples that I'm going to present to you, why the companions had ikhtilaf, and as a result, every scholar is going to have ikhtilaf in the same way for the same reasons after them. If it happened to them, min babil ola, it's going to happen to people after. May Allah be pleased with them. I'm going to make it easy for you, inshallah. I just give you examples with Umar, the Amir al -Mu'minin. And as I told you last week, Umar, if there was a Nabi after him, it would have been him. Umar radiallahu anhu, if the people had an opinion and he had another opinion, it was usually his opinion, which was the right one. When the Prophet was there, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the Nabi was there, it happened a lot. But look at the situations that transpired with this man. And he's from the most knowledgeable of the companions. Only one other person is more knowledgeable than him. And that's Abu Bakr. But look what happened to him. And there are many reasons. All Umar. First reason is that sometimes there's ikhtilaf between the scholars of Al-Islam. Between the madahibs. Between people themselves. That ikhtilaf comes as a result because the delil didn't reach the person. So he's not doing raf al yadain because he never heard of that hadith. He never heard of the instruction of Amin. He never heard of it. So if it didn't come to him, Allah doesn't burden a person beyond his scope. You have to have knowledge before you're blameworthy. So if the delil didn't come to the individual, you can't blame him. And this is why the scholars of the past, Ikhwani, like Al-Imam Malik, who was very fair and very just, when the Amir during that time 
wanted to make all of the Muslims follow the mawatta of Imam Malik, he said, no way, Amirul Mu'mineen, don't do that. This is wrong. It's going to bring corruption. It's going to bring vulm, fasad. And that's because my book, the mawatta, it has a lot of the sunnah, but there's no human being that wrote a book except much of the sunnah passed him by. There are things that didn't come to me that I didn't put in my book. It passed me by. So if it passed him by and he doesn't know the delil, what are you going to do? And that happened with all of those imams, all of them. The delil didn't come to him. So it is an innovation and it is a sin and it is takzeeb of the kitab and the Quran for an individual to always think the imam of the madhat must have known. What are you talking about he must have known? Maybe he knew, maybe he didn't know, but there's no delil that he must have known. Some of the simplest things, some of the scholars from the companions, it passed them by. In the case of Umar, doing his khilafah, when they traveled to Asham, as has been collected by Imam al-Bukhari, on the way of traveling, they came to a city, and that city, in the famous, well-known hadith, had a plague. So he stopped and he asked the people, what do you think we should do? Ansar, muhajireen. Some of the Ansar said, let's keep going. Some of the Ansar said, let's go back. Okay, you Muhajireen, what should we do? Some of the Muhajireen said, let's keep going. Some of them said, let's go back. Ikhtilaf between everybody. Do we go forward? Do we move back? And I didn't know what to do. At that moment, one of the ten people promised Jannah. Abu Rubaid ibn Jarrah, he came. He wasn't present when Umar asked the people for their opinion. He came. He heard about this story. He said, Ya Amir al I heard that the Prophet said, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, the Nabi, he mentioned, if any of you hears about a plague inside of a land and you're not in it, then don't go in it. And if the plague is there and you're in it, then don't leave it. When Umar heard that Dalil, when the companions heard that Dalil, now it was clear what to do. Prior to that, that one person, Hadith Ahad, no one said to him, you got to bring someone else. That's an innovation that people have. We don't accept the Hadith al Ahad in Aqidah or Ahkam. There's a hukum right here. Do we go in? Do we not go in when there's a plague? That's a hukum connected to the blood. People playing with the religion. And as a result of that, they made a lot of ikhtilaf in the usul of the religion. In the usul of the religion. So they went back. Another famous example with Umar again. The hadith didn't come to him. Hadith of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari who came and knocked on his door. And Umar didn't give him permission to come in at first. And then when he came permission, the man had left. When Umar saw him, he said, why, why did you leave? He told him a hadith. I heard that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you knock three times and the door is not open, you should go away. Don't stand at the door. Um, I said, I never heard that hadith. I never heard it. And I told you last week about the virtues of Umar. From his virtues is that the Prophet used to always say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I believe in it and Abu Bakr and Umar believe in it. I came and Abu Bakr and Umar came. I went and Abu Bakr and Umar, they went. How is it possible that... Umar ibn al-Khattab didn't hear about the hadith of how to knock on the door. How is that possible? It's possible because it's a sign, it's a delil, it's a lesson. If that small, easy, mundane, everyday issue can pass him by, then anything can pass him by. And it can pass your sheikh by. And it can pass you by. So relax. It is not justice and it's not academic or scholastic for a person to retort and say, the imam must have known Okay, you give me the delil that he's known. Because if you, know, if you can't give me the delil, you can't build fiqh issues upon that. So those are two examples, and they are many, where the companion, he didn't know. So as a result of that, he took a position against the thing. But when the delil came, he got with the program. So the delil doesn't reach the person. And Ikhwani, everybody here, everybody who is living, Many delils have passed us by. Many delils have passed us by. It's natural. And that's because no one is muhitun bil ilm. No one has all of the knowledge. No one. Second issue, again with Umar, is that the delil came to the scholar, came to the person, but he didn't feel that 
the one who was telling him this Delil knew better than him or knew more than him. So he didn't accept the opinion of the one who's telling him something. So here's a scholar, he's a big scholar and he's been teaching forever and he's well read and he's well learned and someone who's a new student of knowledge, he is an individual who is not really that significant, he's not known for knowledge, he comes to the sheikh and he tells the sheikh about something going against what the sheikh is saying and the sheikh says to himself, this is a young person and I don't think he knows. I'm not going to leave what I believe and what I think is right with my delil for the statement of this person. Not putting him down, but it is a position that the person is making ijtihad in. He's a brand new Muslim. How in the world is he going to know such an answer for an example? Again, it happened with Umar. There was a companion as it was collected by Imam Bukhari, a Muslim. Her name is Fatima bintu Qais. May Allah be pleased with her. A really good lady from the companion. She was married and her husband divorced her three times. So it was an irrevocable divorce. After the third divorce, the husband, out of the generosity of his heart and trying to do the right thing, he sent her some barley and said, this is for your idda period. She's divorced three times. He sent her barley. Barley is not something that's big. So when she received the, bar the barley, she didn't like it. She didn't want it. She wanted more than barley. Don't send me no barley. Send me a camel or something, and then we can discuss it. But don't send me no barley. I'm married to you, and now I'm in my head. Then you send me some barley. She said, I'm not having it. She sent it back. I don't want that. So they went to complain to the Nabi about their situation. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the Prophet informed her and informed her husband and the people that were there. He told them, if a woman is divorced three times, irrevocable, the husband, the ex-husband, he doesn't have to do anything for her. He doesn't have to give her nafaka and he doesn't have to give her sukna. He's not responsible for her lodging. He's not responsible for feeding her, clothing her if she's the only one who's there. If she has children, then it's a different issue. This lady didn't have any children, so get that right. If she has children and he has children by her, it's a different issue. It's a different issue. فَنْفِقُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ حَتَّى يَدَعْنَ حَمْلُهُنَّ Allah said about the divorced women, they've been divorced irrevocably. Allah Ta'ala said, if she's in her idda, you got to continue to pay for her idda. You got to continue to pay for her idda uh, while pay for her while she's pregnant until she lets her load down, which is the end of her idda. So anyway, the point here is, that lady knew what happened to her in her life. During the khilaf of Umar, someone divorced another lady irrevocably, and the same issue happened. And they went to the Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar. Umar said to the man, the ex-husband, you have to continue to provide for her, and you have to continue to give her lodging. He didn't know. He didn't know about that. That was his ruling. Fatima bin Tuqais came. Fatima bin Tuqais said, Ya Amir al this is what happened between me and my ex-husband. He divorced me three times, sent me the Bali. We went to the Nabi, the Prophet said that the husband doesn't have to give any sadaqah, any sukna. Umar said, I'm sticking to my opinion. Do you think we're going to leave our opinion for a woman who we don't know if she remember or if she forgot? He wasn't putting her down, but he doesn't know her as a student of, of knowledge. She's not like Aisha. She's not like Um Hani. She's not like Fatima. Are we going to, you think I'm going to leave my position, my opinion for a lady? I don't know if you remember, if you don't remember. And the reality was, the haq was with her. The haq was with her. And we're talking about the etiquette of ikhtilaf. The etiquette. Fatima bintu Qais, when Umar took that position and when he said what he said, she didn't go crazy. Radiallahu anha. She didn't curse out the Amir al-Mu'mineen. She didn't make khuruj against the Amir al-Mu'mineen. She didn't say, look how arrogant he is. He doesn't know everything. She just handled it. He's the Amir and I'm the regular person. So that's a case where the scholar for one reason or another but the reason is not kibber the reason is not arrogance it's not isti'la he rejects it just because 
this person is not an Arab. He's telling me this. There's something inside of the equation that will cause him not to trust the narration of the narrator that's coming to him. Third issue, Ikhwani, that happened with Umar radiallahu anhu, and as I mentioned, there are a lot, is that the Dalil came to him. The Dalil came to him, but he forgot about it. He was aware of it at one time, but he forgot about it. So he gave a ruling and he took a position after forgetting about it, and it was opposite to what was the truth. And everybody forgets. Even Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forgot making the salat as the companions mentioned. He forgot an ayat. He asked Ubay ibn Kaab, did you pray with us? Why didn't you remind me of the ayat? He said, I thought it was abrogated. The Prophet forgot. Sanuqri'uka fala tansa illa yasha Allah. Innuhu ya'lam al-jahru ma yakhfa. We're going to remind you so if you forget anything. Everybody's going to forget. So again, in an incident, the Prophet Sallallahu sent Umar and Ammar ibn Yasir, who's lesser than Umar, obviously. He sent them to do something and they traveled. While they were traveling, both of them had a nocturnal dream, a wet dream, akramukumullah, an ihtilam. Both of them had a dream that caused them to make al ghusl before they pray. So when they woke up in the morning, there was no water. Ahmad ibn Yasir knows that the ground is a purifier to make a tayammum. The hadith said that. The ayat of the Quran said that. For tayammamu sa'idan tayyibah. Make tayammum when there's no water. Wajuilat li an ard masjidim wa tahara. The earth has been made a masjid for my ummah and a purification. We can make tayammum. Ammar, he knew this. There's no water, so he decided to get in the dirt and he turned around in the dirt and he got dirt all over his body, figuring if there was water, I would take a ghusl and get all in my body, all over. So I'm going to do this with the dirt. So he rolled around in the dirt and went in his hair, through his toes, his fingers, his feet, everywhere. And he got up and he started cleaning himself off. And he said to Ammar, come on, go ahead, do it. Ammar said, I'm not doing that. His fitra said, I'm not going to put myself in the dirt like a donkey, like a camel. I'm not doing that. His fitra made him not do it. He just, it just didn't sit well with him. So what did he do? He didn't even pray. Fajr came up, the sun, and it went. And he didn't even pray. Because he knows you have to have wudu. You have to have tahara to pray. And he's not on tahara. So Ahmad did what he did, and he prayed. Umar did what he did and he didn't pray. They got to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ikhtilaf between these two scholars from the companions. They told him the story. The Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam having a nice sense of humor. He smiled at the story. He thought what Ammar did was gharib, ajib. He thought that was a bit funny. He smiled. He said, "Kana yakfika an taqul hakatha." It was enough for you, Ammar. Just to do like this, hit the earth, he hit the earth one time and he washed the back of his hands and the front of his hands showing. It was enough for you to make a tayammum. So after the death of the Prophet wasallam, doing the khilaf of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Ammar used to tell people this story, he used to tell people this hadith, this incident. Doing the khilaf of Umar radiallahu anhu, Umar heard Ammar was telling people this story. Umar said, bring Ammar here. He said, Ammar, ittaqillah. What are you talking about? He said, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, don't you remember? We were traveling, we were together. And I did this and you did that? He said, Wallahi, I don't remember that. Ammar said, Okay, Amir al Mu'minin, if you want, I'll stop saying it. If you want, if you order, I'll stop telling the people about this ish issue for the overall good, the maslaha, the benefit. Abdullah bin Mas'ul said, Al Khilaf, Shar. Having ikhtilaf unnecessarily is evil, especially when it's going to compromise the stability of the community. On the day of the Eid, we're going to tell the people, hey, we're going to pray at 9 o'clock, guys, 9 o'clock. But when 88,000 people are converging on that one spot, you can imagine the amount of pressure that it's going to put on the infrastructure 
in this area, in this city already. When we drop the kids off, pick the kids up from school, you guys know how it is in Birmingham. You don't want to be a driver during the time of Birmingham. The husband and the wife have ikhtilaf. Who's going to go get those kids? Because you get stuck in the traffic. 88,000 people. So what does the community do? The administration. They have to make a call. Hit the ground running. What's the call? We have to delay this prayer. We cannot possibly start at 9 o'clock. Because if we start at 9 o'clock, many people are going to miss the prayer. They're going to miss the prayer. So they wait, 9.30, 9.45. Now, I understand. Some people came there, and they're about the time, and they have wudu. Now they've been sitting there for an hour, hour, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Now he's struggling with his wudu. So some of the people in the first few rows, they want to make an inkilab. They want to overthrow everything and just do their own aid. That's not how we deal with issues. Al-khilaf, shar, this type of ikhtilaf is evil. You have every right to complain about they didn't start on time. Now the issue is how do you complain? And to whom do you complain? So Ahmad told him, I won't talk about it if you want. Umaru radiallahu anhu said, no, 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 don't worry. Continue to tell the people what you believe is the truth. So Umar never accepted that because he forgot about it. And this happens a lot with especially the scholars of al-hadith when it comes to memorizing the men in the chain of narration who was your sheikh and who did you teach and sometimes people forget who they took from and that's why again in the issue of ajar wa ta'adil this is one of the most difficult aspects of knowledge on the face of the earth and it's not for every amr bakr and zayd to get into it and to practice it in a way that it has been practiced Ikhtilaf between the scholars. Al Imam Ahmed will say something about him. Al Imam Yahya bin Ma'in will say something else. And he didn't fight him for his position, nor did he fight him for his position, nor did he say to his students, hate him for that. It wasn't like that. So the person forgot the Dalil. What happens if he forgot the Dalil? How are you going to be rough with him, tough with him? So let it go. Keep it moving. Another issue, Ikhwani, is that. The Dalil came, but the Dalil could be understood in multiple ways. And this happens a lot in the Quran and the Sunnah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given what was called Jawami' al-Kalim, that eloquence that he had. So people can listen to his words and understand it in different ways. They can listen to the ayat of the Quran, understand it in different ways. And it can just be the tafsir of an ayat, or it can be the actual ramifications of the ayat. Like we mentioned many times, Surat al-Mustaqim, Ihdina Surat al-Mustaqim. What's the Surat al-Mustaqim? Some people said the Surat al-Mustaqim is Abu Bakr and Umar, the companions. Guide us on their way. The Surat al-Mustaqim, some people said, Al-Ikhlas, guide us to Al-Ikhlas. Some people said that the Surat al-Mustaqim, La ilaha illallah. The Surat al-Mustaqim, Al-Iman. The Surat al-Mustaqim, Al-Itidal, being balanced. Different opinions, but they're all correct. Because it all could be understood like that and there are proofs to show all of those are applicable. So that's just the tafsir. But sometimes there's fiqh, jurisprudence, and what you do about the ayat that's understood different ways. Like the ayat that said, if you need a ghusl for the hadith al-akbar, you have to make a ghusl. And one of the reasons the ayah said, or you touch the women. If you touch the women. Some of the scholars meant, if you just touch the woman, you have to make wudu. And this is in some of the madahib, and some of our elders are upon this stuff. That our elders believe, if they touch a woman, they will do breaks. Whether it's the wife, the daughter, and not mahram, he's, not a, he's a not mahram to the woman, some of the people upon that. So you know that's not right because you know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he had wudu, he kissed his wife and he went and he made salat. He was praying and he used to touch Aisha to pull her feet back in while he was praying. You know that. So when you see the uncle and you see that the uncle is saying, the elderly man is saying, if you touch a woman, it, broke, it breaks your wudu. If you touch a non-Muslim, breaks your wudu. 
innamal mushrikun al najis the ayah said so you can't shake their hands don't go off on a man don't go overboard with the man educate the man because there are scholars who took that position there are scholars who took that position some of the ulama said la mustum nisa means when you touch the woman in a way that gets you excited and some of them said it means if you have relationships with the women. And that's the correct understanding of the ayat. That if an individual were to have relationships with a woman and he were to go all the way, then in this case he has to make the ghusl. And if he can't find the ghusl of the water, then he has to make a tayammum. Again, what's the point here? The thing is accepted and it is understood in multiple ways. That happened with the companions عنهم, on more than one occasion when the Nabi of Islam وسلم, told them no one should pray Salat al-Asr except in Bani Quraitha. When they went there, some of them prayed before getting to Bani Quraitha and some of them prayed after arriving to Bani Quraitha when he heard what had happened and they had ikhtilaf at a pivotal time. Again, the army needed to stay together. He said to everybody, no one pray Asr except till you reach the Bani Quraitha. When they went, Asr came and they hadn't reached yet. Some of them, they all stopped. They said, we have to pray right now because it's time for Asr. They said, no, no, no. The prophet said, don't pray until we get there. They was, the other ones said, no, he meant to be quick and do it. Be diligent, be serious in the effort to get there. They said, how you know he, he meant that? He told us clearly, don't pray till we get there. It's apparent. There's no this way, that way. So those people left and the army split and those remained behind. When he heard that, he didn't rebuke those who left. He didn't rebuke those who stayed behind because both groups are understanding the delil in the proper way. Both of them. And in this case, neither of the two groups can claim that their position is more stronger than the other one because the Prophet ﷺ sakata wa aqarrahum, he was quiet. Now, now, during our time, a person can understand it this way and another one can understand it that way. And one of the two groups can say, although you can understand it that way, this one is stronger. If you touch the women, yeah, you can understand it just touch like that. You can understand where you be having shahwa a little bit. You can understand that. But the ayat, the way it should be understood, the strongest proof is, it means here, after you have relationships. Why? Because there's proof to show this is what it means. This is what it means. So when we know all of these issues, ikhwani, again, we know how to deal with people. We know how to deal with people. This is an ikhtilaf in the branch of the religion. This is an ikhtilaf, and he's taking the position of a bona fide scholar. This is ikhtilaf that comes as a result of the man made ijtihad and he did the best that he can do and so forth and so on. Last one, and there are quite a few, is the thing has been abrogated and the scholar didn't know that it was abrogated. So he's taken the position of a hadith that it was authentic at one time, but it's abrogated. And in this example, it goes to show that there was ikhtilaf between the companions and some of the tabi'een. And the tabi'een were right. So that goes to show that knowledge, there's no jamud in knowledge. The thing that is jammed is like this wall. It doesn't move. You push it, it doesn't give. There's no flexibility. Some people think knowledge is like that. So they say, you must follow the madhab and just be a soldier in the madhab and don't move one inch to the right or the left. And that doesn't make any sense. Because how much, how much did the first people leave for the last people? And how much did the later people come to the conclusions of things that maybe the first people, they had a better idea of what was going on? That happened with the companions. Ikhtilaf between the companions who were better than the tabi'in. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, from his many students uh, two of the two of the tabi'een one of his name is al-aswad and the other one is al-qama they were praying with abdullah ibn mas'ud one to the right one to the left in the beginning of islam when they used to pray and the man goes into the rukur he would put his hands 
between his legs. That's how they did real quick. He would put his hands and his palms would be inside of his legs in real court. And then that was abrogated and the hands were put and placed on the knees. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he didn't know about the abrogation. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, what he did was he physically moved their hands from having them on the knees and he made them do it the other way. After the slot was over, they explained to him where that came from, that they heard this hadith from other companions. And then that's how Abdullah ibn Mas'ud changed his position. Serious issue, serious issue. They came and they asked Abdullah ibn Abbas about muta'a marriage. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is no longer on the scene. Rasulullah is not alive anymore. Hey, Abdullah ibn Abbas, can we do muta'a marriage? He said, yeah, you could do that. Prophet Muhammad allowed us to do muta'a marriage. We used to do that, muta'a marriage, where you go into a contract temporarily with a lady and then you agree to this, agree to that. After the time is over, you go your way, she goes her way, and whatever you agreed upon concerning the child, anything other than that, everybody fulfills their agreement. There's a specific time and condition and context that that happened. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, never, Abdullah bin Abbasin, he never heard that that ruling was abrogated. That hadith is in Sahih Bukhari where he gave the fatwa, it is permissible to do muta marriage and that happened after the Nabi. So someone comes and he says, I found this hadith, it's in Sahih Bukhari, Abdullah ibn Abbas said you could do muta marriage. No. Nope. Abdullah ibn Abbas wasn't aware of the abrogated ruling concerning that. That the Prophet ﷺ, when he conquered, when he conquered Mecca, and one hadith said he conquered Khaybar, he made muta marriage haram. So if the scholar is going to give a ruling based upon a hadith that is mansukh, then actually abrogated, it's going to be ikhtilaf. Very last one, ikhwani. And they are more than this. But these are the basic and the main ones. The person is using a weak hadith. And as a result of using the weak hadith, he's going to be doing something that's in contradiction to the haq. Like the issue of salatul tasbih. There are those scholars who say that this hadith is not authentic. 20 rakat for salatul taraweeh. There are those ulama who say that more than 11, all of those narrations are not authentic. The ones that say Umar did 20 and so forth, they're not authentic. Rasulullah did 20, they're not authentic. So as a result of the weak hadith, according to the one who sees it as being weak, it's going to be ikhtilaf. Now, when we do this Ramadan, every Ramadan, and we see the people doing 20, and we see the people, the whole thing about the ikhtilaf of when Ramadan starts and when it ends and the ikhtilaf that happens, again, the real student of knowledge, the real Muslim, he looks at these issues and he knows how to deal with them. He knows how to deal with them. He's not going to get bent out of shape as it relates to his family practicing the aid a day before or day after. It's not going to be that much of a big issue for him. It's not going to be a big problem. The Muslim who's existing and he looks at the outer community, he's not going to hate people on that. Look at himself as being something special and everybody else is off of it and something's wrong with everybody else. No, they have a point of view and these ikhtilafs, they don't require all of that. Making hajj, making hajj. When we perform hajj, already hajj is jihad. Hajj is difficult. People who never made hajj, there's a lot of things you need to know. So, you have to make it easy for the people. You have to let them know that the Prophet wasallam, when he was asked, should I do this? He said, no problem. Should I do that? No problem. Should I do that? No problem. Make it easy. And then in the issues that you know they could be a bit difficult for the people, the student of knowledge doesn't make fitna on the pilgrims who are from the awam, the ammat nas There's a hadith that is authentic. The hadith said, if a person does not get down to the Kaaba to make tawaf on the day of, make the tawaf al-ifada before maghrib, if he doesn't do it, he has to put his ihram back on. Not a lot of people took that position. The Ulam al-Hadith took that position. And that hadith is authentic, inshallah. Some of the contemporary ulama, when you ask them this question, 
They say, well, we don't know anybody who works by the hadith. That's their position. People who perform hajj with you, that's not even in their madhah. So you give people your opinion. If they care to listen, alhamdulillah, they listen. If they don't want to listen, let them do what their madhab says. No problem. You did your job and you don't have to be judgmental. You don't have to be rough. You don't have to be nasty. You don't have to look at the other people who's hating Islam and hating the Dalil. It's the level of the people. As for the one who was making ikhtilaf in the usul of the religion and he's an imam of innovation and he's a troublemaker and he is a person who is problematic, then this individual is going to be dealt with appropriately. So don't think that I'm saying every ikhtilaf, we just, it's all, everything is all, it's okay. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. There is an ikhtilaf that is mu'tabr. It is considered. We take it into consideration. And then there's an ikhtilaf. We don't take it into consideration at all. Cursing the companions. There's no room to consider it. No room, no room. So the people who say that, we're going to deal with them a particular way. Unless they're just from the regular, awam, regular people. Then we're going to deal with them accordingly. The Quran, is it created, not created? No ikhtilaf for that. No ikhtilaf. We're not going to say it's ikhtilaf in that issue. Because the ikhtilaf here is in the usul of the religion it was created by the people the Prophet spoke about during that time, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the um is going to break up into 73 sects, all of them being a hellfire. So we're not going to tolerate that. The ikhtilaf of a takfir and all of this nonsense. No, no, no. He said, fight the khawarij. Whoever fights them is going to get a reward. If they kill you, you go to Jannah, you kill them, you get a reward from Allah Azza wa You don't say it's ikhtilaf with these people. You don't say ikhtilaf. He said, deal with them individuals. Deal with them. So we have to get ikhwani some fiqh of the ikhtilaf because the companions, Ridwan Allah, they had quite a bit of ikhtilaf concerning quite a few issues. If you brothers have any questions, three minutes, five minutes, we'll deal with any questions that you may have. Tfadli ya akhi, Kareem. That's a good question. Who's responsible for advising people what to do and what not to do? Is it for any Amr, Bakr, and Zaid to start advising people? There's a balance in the middle, of course, in this issue. We have to take into consideration what Ali ibn Abi Talib said. He said, knowledge in the past was just a dot. Knowledge was just a dot. And then people started getting into the arena and the realm of knowledge who didn't belong. And then it became... Confusion and ikhtilaf. Ar-Rahman ala al-arsh istawa. Allah Rahman is over his throne in a way that befits his majesty. When that ayah came down in Surah, in surah Taha, not a single companion said, how, why, when, where. But what about in the nighttime when the sun goes up? And what about in China? They didn't say that. They just submitted. And then the people started coming and they started saying things and it got involved. So it became a lot of confusion and ikhtilaf. And that's because people were speaking and they didn't know what they were talking about. Don't talk about what you don't know about. But then on the other hand, we have the instruction of Al Mustafa and Mujtaba, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who told the people, Balligu anni walo ayah. Tell the people about me, even if it's a small thing. If you know something, then you're responsible for telling people. So those simple things, those easy things that we have no doubt this thing is from the religion, then everybody is responsible for telling people what you know. But for more complicated issues, bigger issues that you may think you know or you may not be that, that mutamekin in it, then you should think twice and you shouldn't be the one who is advising people concerning things that may be on a higher level. Something like Ruf al Yadain is a basic mas'ala that's easy to comprehend. He knows it and he's going to tell people about it. Something about wudu, he's going to tell people about it. You go in a masjid with your right foot, you come out with your left foot, 
he's not going to hesitate to tell people about it. Straighten out the lines and so forth and so on. He knows these lines should be straight. He's going to tell the people about it. But do we give him the green light to start telling the people about the loan for the student, the student loans? Do we give him the green light, start telling everybody about his position concerning organ transplants? Do we start giving him the green light and the permission to start talking about who's a kafir, who's not a kafir? We're going to say to him, pump your brakes, fall back and relax and stay in your lane and don't make yourself bigger than what you are. Allah knows best. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Tafadli ya akhi ya Nuruddin. Someone is saying whenever you bring him the delil, he said, look, I'm going to stick with my sheikh, my imam. I'm a muqallid. I don't have the ability to appreciate the reality of the hadith. So even if you brought me the hadith or the ayat, I don't know about it. It must be some interpretation. I think a person who's on this way of religion, his religion is da'if. His religion is da'if. They're those people who worship Allah. They don't know what they're doing. Because the religion of Islam is not that complicated. Where a person is mutaraddit, shak, khaif, he's afraid of knowing the haq when it comes to him. The ayat, the adillah are telling us, follow the kitab, follow the sunnah when it comes to you. And the ayat of the Quran are clear. They're wadihat. And a few of them are from the mutashabihat. But most of the Quran, most of the hadith, it is simple to understand. It's easy to understand. So Allah was asking those kuffar of Quraysh over and over again in one of the surahs of Quran, of Allahi shak. Do you have any doubt about Allah? You in doubt about your religion? And the other thing is, that position, person should know is you're ignorant. You're screaming to the people, lisan halik, you're saying, I'm ignorant. Because the muqallid is the person who takes the dalil of someone else, takes someone else's position and he doesn't know the dalil. So he's saying, I'm ignorant. I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm satisfied with being like that. And an Islam is telling us, Muslim. Rasulullah said, you got to get knowledge. It's wajib upon you to take off of yourself ignorance. But you say, no, no, I want to remain ignorant. I want to stay this way. Be in a race with one another. Do good. Got to be in a race. So you don't want to just leave yourself ignorant of murid. Everything that's touched, you're just going to drink it like that. But there are those issues that we have to have wara. We have to have wara. We have to have awareness and we have to be careful. We have to have awareness and we have to be careful. So in that case, an individual, he may say, this mas'ala is bigger than me. And in closing, this is one of the reasons why I would advise you brothers with the English Q&A webpage of a Sheikh Muhammad ibn Saleh al Munajjid, Because his webpage, when he gives fatwas, one of the things that's good and beneficial about his webpage is, his fatwas is, he's going to always bring dalil, alhamdulillah. And second of all, he's going to always bring the imams who are current and the ones who are in the past who took those positions. Now, if I said, he's all, he only brings what the sheikh said, Sheikh Ibn Bazim al Thaymeen. Oh, that's nice, but that ain't the fiqh. Because a Sheikh Ibn Baz, Sheikh Ibn Thaymeen, as we mentioned, Without putting them down, but we mentioned this, the sunnah has passed everybody. 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 So why should we turn to his site? Because all the fatwas Ibn Baz, Ibn Uthameen. No, that's not a scholastic answer. It's because he brings the delil, and every time he gives a position, he adds on to that the sheikhs who said that position. So this way a person is seeing this delil is being understood in this particular way. And it gives them more basira and yaqeen, inshallah, to take that position. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us fuqaha 
in our in, in this religion, fuqa, on our own levels, where we know what we're doing. And may he subhanahu wa ta'ala establish our feet firmly upon the kitab and sunnah. Give us insaf and an itidal as it relates to judging people when they have differences with us and not make us of uh, the ghulat in al-Islam who are very intolerant, very angry of people who don't see things the way they see it. Even in our interpersonal relationships with our wives and our husbands and our relatives. Take it easy with the ikhtilaf. Relax with the ikhtilaf. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam mubarak ala nabiyyina subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika wa ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Tomorrow inshallah ikhwani is the next talk about the 10 people who promised Jannah after Salat al-Maghrib inshallah barakallahu fikum.